safety presentation I have, um, depending on your background and where you come from, most of you guys are going to know what we're talking about. Now, why, are, why do I have to talk about it? Well, it's, it's by law, okay? So we get governed by several state and federal agencies. So a lot of what we're going to cover here is mandatory. You get hired, we got to talk about it, okay? Um, bring forth questions, bring forth your experiences as we come through. I want to hear it. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'll go there. That's me, okay? My office is right where the time clocks are. So you come up the stairs here, I'm the first office. You walked by me on the way down to come down here, okay? You'll notice my door is always open. There's a reason. Generally, I'm not involved in any discipline here. I need you guys to be my eyes and ears out there. Uh, I'm here to help. I'm not here to write tickets. I'm not a traffic cop, okay? I'm not trying to jam everybody. Tell me what you need, okay? I can't read your mind. I tell my daughters this all the time. Tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what you need. You need something? We got a process to make something better? I gotta know, okay? That's just it, okay? I'm, uh, except in the most extreme circumstances, I'm not involved in any uh, disciplinary issues or um, that type of thing, okay? I'm generally here to just make this place better and make it run better for all of us, okay? Got it? We know how to exit here in case we had a fire, right? The two staircases up and out, we take you outside, one to the right, one to the left, bathrooms are around the corner, right? So my expectations here, okay, it's pretty simple. Nothing we do here is worth getting hurt for, and boy is that the truth. I'm like a work comp poster child, not like a work comp poster child, I am. It's a narcotic cop, I fell off an overpass uh, on a drug deal. It's, sanctioned by the police department. I wasn't buying drugs for myself. And I fell off, I fell off an overpass and, and, and broke my hip, okay, in my back. Couldn't return. Um, now, we're not making cabinets doing that job, but, but there's, nothing, there's nothing here that's worth getting hurt for. Um, it's just not, it's a losing system. Work comp and that whole process is just, you're not gonna buy a boat. You're just gonna barely slide by and get just a minimal amount. So I'm gonna do everything I can to try to keep us out of that system, to try to improve it so we don't have to dial into that. And I'm speaking from experience, okay? Um, it's horrible, I lost a career over it, a good paying career. If I was still there right now, I'd be retiring with a pension, okay? And I, I'm not anymore, and it wasn't because I got fired or anything like that, it's because I got hurt. Work comp's a bummer, bummer system, okay? Um, no task is worth uh, getting hurt for. If you don't have the technical knowledge, ask the questions, okay? Ask the questions. I'll get your back if somebody says Max is going too slow because he's learning how to do the job and they have a problem with that. I'll step in, okay? As long as you're doing it safe and you're doing what you're supposed to do, I'll take care of that, okay? Ask the questions, get the help you need. We don't want you doing something you don't know. Safety is everybody's responsibility. I don't care if it's Dave Gerstner, the guy that that's the president of the company. Do it nicely, but we're going to call out safety things as we see them. Okay, your supervisor's doing something. You see something that's being done. Somebody's on a scissor lift without the chain covered on it. Somebody's hitchhiking on the back of a forklift. Let's call it out and stop it. Okay, stop the unsafe act. Do it appropriately, and let's get it fixed. Okay, nobody's too proud here. We can all learn from this. So call out unsafe acts as you see them. Let's stop them and get them right. Okay. Every injury could have and should have been prevented. About 98% of <clears throat> true, okay? There's accidents, right? Accidents happen through no fault. But I'm gonna tell you that uh, although this says we have zero tolerance for unsafe accident conditions, uh, report all everything immediately, and activity, we're gonna lead to continuous improvement here. Most of these could have been prevented. I can, I'll give you, I can give you 100 examples, I'll give you a couple. One is we had a piece of machinery that wasn't was it maintained right if there was a problem with the maintenance aspect of it caused an injury. That's something the employer should have been able to, through the maintenance function, we should have been able to fix, right? We should have been able to fix that. I'll give you another example. We had a nice gal, she's walking at the end of the loading line where they package all the materials and we run it down the roller line. She had a slip and a fall. That's fine, we take care of her. I'm not asking questions. We're gonna get her right. It's just a bump and a bruise, took care of it. She was wearing sweatpants that came down past her shoes. You know what I mean? It's something that we could have prevented here with good. Anyway, the point is on that is that it's, it's mostly accurate. Most of them could have been prevented either through an action as the employer or an action as the employee, okay? Uh, let's identify those things, let's fix it, let's learn from those. They're not all about the, the knife stick and turn trying to get people in trouble. We just want to fix it and get it right, okay? 
And then we talked about work, work comp a little bit. Horrible system, nobody really wins on this. Um, you're not gonna go and buy a boat or take a, a Bahama vacation with what you get from work comp. It's the bare minimum. And then look, lest we forget, we're human beings. So you have a family that relies on you to make your money. When you're not working here, you're not making that money, you're making a lot less. It's, it's just kind of a bunk system, okay? It's there to protect you in the case of bad circumstance, but we're gonna do everything we can to try to do it. I'll tell you a story here. We pay the same, it's, it's a huge dollar amount, multiple levels of six figures. We pay the same premium at this place of about 280 employees that, that we paid when I, when I was at St. Norbert College. It's 2,800 employees over a 100 acre campus on 70 buildings. We pay the same premium. Five acres, one building here, 280 employees, 2,800 employees on 70 buildings and 100 acres, okay? Pay the same premium here. Now, they're not making cabins, right? Some old professors and some other jobs, but they do a lot. But that gives you an idea of how much is expended in that system, okay, that we have to pay into. If we can control just what we can control with that, everybody on the plant floor can get a thousand bucks. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a big deal. Um, so let's, let's identify problems. We don't need to wait for somebody to get a board to the head to identify those problems. Let's fix those things and find them, okay? scan your card in. And there's also a proof. The time clock doesn't work, which they don't work a lot of the times. You scan your card in there, it gives you proof that you came here on the time that you're supposed to come here, okay? And also you're walking down the same staircase, so if it's wet outside or slushy or whatever, you walk past your lockers, you can put all your stuff away, you can put your lunch away, right? So it's kind of a security, there's a bunch of reasons for it. Please respect that. Now, if you're after you do that and you come in for the day and you scan in and you're good and you got to exit through different doors and do your different work, no problem. Go do your work, okay? I'm just talking when you first come in. Yep. Please come in through that main employee door, okay, where you got to scan your card in. Do we understand that? Okay, kind of security reason, right? We want to make sure and then also a way to prove that you're here and, and uh, to stow all your stuff and weather and all that, okay? Any questions on that? The letters that you're seeing in here are our overhead doors, like the truck bays, okay? So there's a lot of those, just be uh, just pointing that out on the, on the map here so you know what you're looking at, okay? Numbers are service doors like that. Letters are the big roll-up doors for trucks, right? Okay. Active shooter, okay? What was the old way to do it? The old way, anybody know the old way for active shooter? Everybody hide. Well, they figured out that that didn't work real well because the perpetrators would come and find the easy target, right? They they do damage, right? They come through. So the, the the newer way, which is not that new, it's probably six or seven years old, is run, run first, hide if you must, fight as a last resort. Run, hide, fight. What does run mean? Run means there's no rally point. Get out, right? Get the heck out of here now. Out. Run. Hide is we have one doorway here, right? The guy's out here, he's got a gun. Well, let's get out of view. Let's place a large object between us and him or her, right? That's, that's the high part, let's turn the lights off, maybe barricade the door if we can, that's the high part of it. Fight is, he's coming in, okay? He's coming in, we gotta disarm him, okay? The only thing I'm gonna say about the fight part of it is if all of us in this room commit to disarm that person coming in with the gun, we will win. Somebody will get hurt, very likely but we will win. So fight doesn't mean throw a paper ball at him when he's coming in. Fight means you're grabbing a chair, you're grabbing that pen and using it as a, as a blunt, you know what I mean, whatever, we're gonna disarm him. So just, I'm not trying to make us all law enforcement here, just wrap your head around the idea of fight is not, you know, go away. You know, I mean, we're, we're going into fight to disarm the guy. We will win, 
Okay, if we all have that mentality, we will win. Any questions on this? Right. The only other thing I'm going to say about the, the active shooters, we haven't had any incident like that here. We have had ex-girlfriends and boyfriends and people uh, having relationships with each other that are, are inappropriate and, and some unhappy party involved in that where they're threatening maybe some bodily harm on that. That's what predicated locking all those external doors that way. We had an issue where law enforcement was coming through and they were going to bang the doors and come around. Don't make yourself a target. Take the phone out of your hands, have your hands up, maybe drop down to your knees, follow their instructions. Because sometimes they don't know who the bad guy is or girl, right? Just be familiar with that. It's going to be a long day for everybody. Be patient, follow their instructions. Any questions on that? Active shooter. Okay. Personal protective equipment, PPE. The following items are mandatory on my production floor at all times safety shoes. Eye protection, hearing protection, mandatory at all times. Without any, almost there's almost no condition that would preclude that you need to have that. Okay, for safety shoes. Okay, for safety shoes. On your 61st day here, we'll give you a $50 voucher to go to a shoe store to go buy it. It's Rogan's, or you can go buy your own and turn a receipt in for 50 bucks. Okay, we'll do that once a year on your 61st day. Okay. The only thing I'm going to say about that every year thing is if you're wearing a pair of safety shoes and through the work that you do, something falls and splits your shoe open and renders that shoe no longer effective, right? Come and see me. I will issue you a new voucher. I just don't want to buy you new shoes every two weeks, okay? <laughs> or for your family, right? But, it, but if, if something through the operation of your work causes those shoes to become damaged, don't worry about that one year thing. As long as you're not doing this every three weeks on me. I'll find a way to get you a new certificate, okay? 61st day though, okay? Eye protection, okay? I got all kinds, right? I got ones that'll go over glasses. I got ones that'll, um, that have bifocals in there that are, are better for reading or for you to look at something. I got, I got all different kinds, okay? I got goggles that'll go over everything, right? Like from high school laboratory science. Um, on your 61st day, we have, a, we have a benefit for you, okay? Maybe for you, or not even for you, I got it. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of places you can go, optical places you can go to, where you can get a set of prescription ones. And we'll match you up to 50%, up to $150, okay? Now I did that, right? So I got a little prescription on this thing, but I got the anti-everything anti code <laughs> on these things, right? So anti-glare, anti-fog, all that and they'll match you up to 150, okay? They'll do that every two years, every two years, okay? On your 61st day, starting on your 61st day, okay? Everybody understand that on the eye protection? Okay, and then hearing protection, okay? Same thing, I got a lot. We got the cheap ones that'll, that kind of fall in and out. You can grab out of the packs, the little ones that smoosh like this. Those are ones you can use and throw away every day. I got ones that are more permanent. I got muffs, if you find something's you got any sensitive ears, it doesn't fit right, just come and talk to me, let me know, I got a couple different options, okay? Um, but several different varieties, okay? The other, the reason why I got these other things up here is because it really depends on what you do. So guys that spray paint or product here, they have to wear respirators, okay? Uh, mandatory, they have no choice, they gotta, they gotta wear them. For everybody else, it's not necessary, but if you find that you're sensitive or you're having respiratory distress because of the dust or whatever other reasons, I have an option for you, I can provide that for you, okay? Not required for, for seal sanding, it's not required. Door building, not required, okay? Um, seal sander, maybe you don't need it. You don't, you don't need one, unless, unless you need unless one. Unless I go into an environment that... Correct, I can provide disposable ones, and then for, yeah, your seal sander too. Not required, but if you find yourself reacting negatively, let me know, I'll provide something for you, okay? Kind of the same thing with the gloves. Seal sanding, I'm gonna tell you, I need my fingers, right? I need the I need the dexterity of my finger. I feel the item that I'm sanding. Yep, looks good. You, you need that, okay? So you, you may not need gloves, okay? But if you find that you're having issues or you're getting splinters, we have them. You can augment them. You can cut the fingertips off of them. Whatever you need, okay? Uh, if anybody was in assembly, I'd say you got to wear gloves because they're moving the big cabinets and they're they got their hands pinched into the spots where we got to protect them. But for all you guys, it's not necessary. You, you may use uh, a set of le leather ones depending on the type of 
item you're working on, okay? Um, but Dave will direct you on that. Yeah, but everybody else, uh, foot protection, and just a word on this here, as long as you're buying this anywhere in the United States, it's gonna have the code that, that says it's the right shoe to wear. So I don't care if it's metal or composite, okay? If you buy it from Shanghai, I can't say for sure whether it's a good if it's a shoe or not. Oh, I'm serious. But anything sold in the U.S. with a composite or steel toe, we're good. Okay. Same thing here, right? I can everyone I provide to you is going to be slick. Okay, you're going to be in good shape. Same thing here, right? So this is that um, it's the hierarchy of controls. Is before I get to the point where I say you got to wear shoes, you got to wear glasses, you got to wear hearing protection. We try to do everything we can to eliminate, substitute, or re-engineer a process or control it to get to that point where our last line of defense on the, on the uh, personal protective equipment, before we get to that last line of defense, we try to do things. We try to change chemicals, change environments, improve what we can improve so that, that as a last course, we're saying you gotta wear this, this, and this, okay? So we've, we've done that, it's in a continual process, but there we are, we gotta wear those things, okay? Last line of defense. Any questions on PPE? Single slide on material handling, forklift operator, okay? Just like on the roads outside, the pedestrian has the right of way, but just like on the roads outside, I can't run across the highway when there's cars moving 70 miles an hour, right? You're gonna get hurt. That's all I'm asking you to do here with the forklift drivers, okay? They work in tight quarters, they're moving material very well, they do it very safely. It's got a very restricted movement and visual they have problems seeing. Make sure you're making eye contact with them or you're getting some type of nonverbal cue before you go bolting in front of them or behind them, right? So they're going to look at you and say, next stop, right? Go! One of those, just make sure you're making that contact with them. Use your good judgment here, okay? You do have the right of way in the plant, like, like it's supposed to, it's legal. But uh, please make contact with them. Please don't bolt in front of them. They do a good job, and many times they're low, they get kind of blinded with how they're moving back and forth, okay? Ergonomics. So what is ergonomics? It's the, the idea involving the design and arranging workspaces so that people can work efficiently and safely. I will tell you that this is the most regular form of type of injury that we get here are related to the ergonomics, okay? Um, specifically, things that have to do with muscles being sore, nerves being impinged, tendons being stiff, right? Ligaments tight, joints, cartilage, blood vessels, your back. Um, brought on by force, you know, awkward posture, repetition, vibrating tools, or contact stress, right? Here's some of the more prevalent medical terminology for those types of things. Trigger finger, I got a seal sander where I'm using a sanding device where I'm using this with my finger that the joints in the finger start to wear down, right? They start to tighten, they become painful. Bursitis, right, that's the shoulder, right? Impingement on the shoulder, stiffness and soreness on the shoulder, carpal, Carpe diem, carpal tunnel. So the impingement of the medial nerve from the elbow down to the wrist, or the wrist itself, right? Anything involving that elbow to wrist. Osteo osteoarthritis, the degeneration of the discs in the back, right? Where things start to soar and stiff. Tendinitis, elbow, right? You guys are gonna see this, because you're, you're doing this for eight or 10 hours a day, right? My elbow's getting a little stiff. Neck and tension, shoulder, same thing. You're kind of tight here and you're doing your work. You're, your neck and your shoulder kind of tight, right? And you're kind of getting sore. The most prevalent type of injury, what I'm gonna say about this is, if you need some help, let me know. Is it enough that I change your position where you do this for four hours, and then I move you to this side, and move you to this side? Is that enough? Or do we need to switch your roles? Do you need something for your elbow? Do you need something to, like a wrap? or one of those compression elbow things. Let me know, okay? Uh, you start having pain in your whole back a little bit and you need something to kind of keep your back straight, I have those back braces, let me know. Don't make me guess, let me know, okay? I can help you with it. We can work with your supervisor if we need to change your position or your roll around a little bit to keep you moving. You need to stand up and stretch every hour? Yeah, I need to like keep moving if that's possible. That's fine. Oh, yeah. If every hour you gotta take a minute or two and do one of these things and do some of your Right, ergonomic stretches, go do it, okay? Uh, communicate this though, okay? If, if you let your supervisor know, 
Uh, if you don't find your supervisor, let me know. I'll work on your behalf. But these are our most prevalent injuries. We want to address these things. We want to get them fixed. Do I need to put a step on your machine so you're higher or take that step away because the lady before you was four foot eight, right? Take it away so that you're more level on your working surface. Let me know that. Is the table too high? Is it too low? We can fix these things. Just don't make me guess, okay? Let's not make it get worse. Let's fix it. Any questions on that? I know there's a lot more than that okay there's more than hep B hep C and HIV okay there's all manner of things that can be commuted by bodily fluids right but we're going to talk about these as required HIV virus that causes AIDS 1.2 million people living with it symptoms are usually slow onset three to five weeks flu-like symptoms and it may not present it in its final form in several years up to a decade right AIDS Hepatitis B, kind of a strange one, right? Most pathogens at the room temperature level sitting out on this table right now would die within an hour. Hepatitis B is one of those weird ones. It'll live in fecal material for a week, okay? It'll continue to be transmittable for up to a week at room temperature. Uh, 300,000 new infections, it's a liver wasting uh, type of uh, virus. Uh, same type of thing, you got, you got four to six weeks, you get that uh, sim, uh, flu-like symptoms, and then it may not present itself in its full chronic and fatal form several decades later. Same thing with hep C. Most people that have this don't know that they're carrying it. 25% of the carriers are diagnosed, which means 75% aren't. Four million people infected, can be chronic and fatal. It is a liver-wasting disease as well, okay? 12,000 deaths annually, you can read that. But there are other blood-borne or bodily fluid-borne illnesses and viruses that can be transmitted besides those three, okay? Let's talk about what are potentially infectious materials. Obviously blood, body fluids that we can identify as body fluids. Anything containing visible blood, I'm coughing and spitting, and I'm spitting out blood, right? Potentially infectious. And anything we just generally can't identify, any type of body fluid we can't identify or we think it is, right? Someone pukes, doesn't say anything, someone spits on the floor, right? How are they transmitted? Well, by puncture, right? You've got a piece of metal where somebody bled on it, that punctures into your skin, like think like a needle, you're, you're gonna be in contact then, right? Contact with open wounds. So you've got an open cut on your hands, you're assisting somebody and you get blood in there or body fluid, right? Broken, damaged skin. Infectious, uh, excuse me, mucous membranes, eyes, mouth, ears, nose, right? Transmission, points of transmission. What I want you to remember for universal precautions is think barrier, okay? Now it's great if, oh, you're hurt. Hold on a second, I'll get my clothes on. I'll be right with you. <clears throat> Put my mask on here too. That's great, if we can do that, that's fantastic. If we can't, improvise, okay? I'm gonna give you an example. We had a guy that had a kickback on a table saw, piece of material came back, struck his hand, gave him a comminuted fracture of his knuckles. It was bleeding like a, looked like hamburger, it was bleeding real bad. Gentleman went and helped him, okay? What did he do? He grabbed, we have clean rags, clean rags, they get laundered, so they're not filled with chemicals. Grabbed a clean rag, boom. Created a barrier, right? Barrier between himself and, and that wound, okay? Now there's a limitation to that, right? It can soak through, right? Yeah. But he created a barrier, okay? He didn't just put his hands on there. So th th improvise if you need to. Plastic bag, rags, your t-shirt, a hat, or whatever. You're gonna render assistance, create a barrier, okay? Uh, try to go get the right item if you can. If you can, improvise, right? Know the limitations of those barriers. Even the rubber gloves can rev, right? They can, they can rip apart. But understand that, understand the limitation and try to create a barrier, okay? Um, remove any PPE or, or contaminated clothing. You render assistance to somebody and they 
they bleed on your on your uh, on your eye protection. Okay, we're gonna remove that. On your clothes, I want to know about it. I don't want you bringing that home and throwing it in the laundry with your kids or your family. You got blood on your shoes. I don't want you bringing it in your car. Okay, give me the opportunity to fix it, to launder it, to replace it. Don't bring it home. Okay, it's it's not going in the laundry at Max's house. That's not the way that works. So if you see anything, you got anything on you, let me know. Okay, let's let's get it right. We have bleach bottles everywhere that can decontaminate uh, areas or, or spots, you know, on the floor or in other places. But more importantly, I don't want you bringing anything home. You're not coming home with anybody else's blood or body fluids on you. Okay. Uh, remember, good hand washing techniques. It's not just the soap; it's the action of doing this that heats up and kills right under the hot water. Right. Okay. And we said properly dispose of contaminated PPE. So if something gets uh, degenerated with bodily fluids, we're going to get rid of it, replace it, laundered, we're going to find a way to fix it. If we were to use these kind of uh, earplugs, would we have to replace them every day? Could we reuse them? Uh, you can reuse them. Um, most people just use them daily. They're, they're kind of the, the use and throw gotcha. variety. Aren't you um, risk any ear infection? That, that and they, they t they're porous, so they, they tend to collect whatever's in the ear canal or dirt. So yeah, generally one, once a day, I, I do use them for a couple days sometimes, depending on where I put them you know, afterward. But, uh, but I have other varieties that are totally reusable. Mm -hmm. You can wash them, you can rub them with alcohol, you can clean them and reuse them for as long as they're usable. They're not falling apart. All right, thank you. Sure. Any questions on that, on Bloodborne? Any questions? Hazardous communication, anybody familiar with this? Hazardous communication. You work with a chemical in any environment, you have the right to know what you're working with, how to protect yourself, what the dangers are. That's what that is, okay? Chemicals, we have a lot of them here, okay? And you have a right to know as an employee on how to protect yourself, where the information is, and how to do all this, okay? So specifically, we're gonna talk about, well, here, here's examples of stuff that we have here, metal working fluids, we run a lot of industrial cleaners, forklift batteries, we have arrays of batteries with acid, Stains, our paints are solvent based, and then we have other solvents, acetone, MAK, um, acetate, butyl, you know, or butyl acetate, rather. Um, but we have a lot of chemicals, and they're rough chemicals. Uh, not radioactive or anything like that, but if, as long as you protect yourself, you, you will be protected, they won't impact you, okay? So specifically, we're gonna talk about what they call the safety data sheets. Anybody familiar with these? Yeah, it used to be MSD. Correct. They used to throw the M in the front there, and they dropped the M for good measure. Uh, these are the sheets that give you they give you everything that you need to do with a chemical. What you can or can't do. Okay, what it is, where it is, how to, how many rabbits does it kill? How can you transport it? Can I drink it like chocolate milk? It'll tell you everything. Okay, um, they're right outside my office. Okay, I don't want to hear anybody say they don't know where they are. They're posted in a big binder. They look just like that. There's two binders on the wall right outside my office. They're broken up into 16 sections. For our purposes, the first 11 or 12 are helpful. 13 through 16 aren't. They're more of like a laboratory thing if you worked in a chemical, uh, for a chemical company, okay? Or how to transport it by truck. We don't do that. How many rabbits can you feed it to before you kill them? We don't do any of that stuff, okay? So a term called process stoppage, okay? And the reason we're going to talk about this process stoppage term is because that's when I want you to think about putting your chemicals away. And that's when we got to think about where to put those chemicals away, okay? Because you know if I leave a can of gas open in a cup in my garage on a Friday, when I come back on Monday, like half of it's gone, right? Because it evaporates in the air. So there's certain things, precautions we need to do. We can't have that happen on the floor. There's certain things we got to talk about. So when I talk about process stoppage, Jacob, that means nobody's coming in after you. So after your shift, you're done, right? There's nobody that's gonna to continue to, to do that where your chemicals are sitting, okay? You're going on vacation, right? Nobody's coming back, okay? This, the process is stopping, okay? That's when we need to think about putting chemicals away, the end of your shift, right? Sealing everything up and putting it away, right? Okay. Um, for flammable chemicals, so again, that's the flame with the line under it and that bottom one for flammable chemicals. Got to be able to identify it if it's in another container, right? We're going back to that whole labeling thing. Got to have it sealed. Got a cover on it. I can't have it evaporated, right? Got to have it all closed. And then stored in a flammable cabinet. They're these yellow cabinets, okay? They're, they're stored in a flammable cabinet and closed, okay? For flammable chemicals. For non-flammable chemicals, a little easier. 
Same thing, I still have to identify what it is, right? So make sure it's labeled. Uh, have it closed so I don't do I don't do one of those things and kick it out onto the floor. And then store it in such a way that I'm not going to come by and do one of these things, right? So that's where you can put it in your wooden cabinets and your benches and all that stuff. Okay, so just to reiterate, flammable, right, right over there. Non flammable, I don't really care as long as it's not in an aisle way. Well, I do care, but you know what I mean, right? We, just, we want it in an area that nobody's going to tip it. Any questions on that? The DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, says we have to talk about hazardous materials because we have them here. We create hazardous waste. So, just like with our normal stuff, good PPE use, wear your gloves, wear your goggles, wear the appropriate items that we're supposed to wear when we're dealing with hazardous waste. What is hazardous waste? That is a chemical that is no longer in its pure form, right? A hazardous chemical that's no longer in its pure form. I take an acetone, you run an acetone through a machine, it spits out paint and all other types of things with that acetone. Now that's pure form, it's, weight. it's hazardous waste. Because it's a flammable, acetone's flammable and hazardous by nature, now I've imbibed waste into it. Hazardous waste, that's what waste is, okay? It wouldn't be anything that's not flammable or some type of hazardous chemical before. So we have like, we have some of our stains, they're good to go, right? They're water-based, they're, they're good to go, they run through. We don't imbibe it with any type of hazardous chemical, that's just waste. Hazardous waste is when it still re retains some of the properties that make it hazard a hazardous chemical to begin with, right? You got me? Mm -hmm. I take gasoline and I pour oil in it, and then I pour, I don't know, dirt water in it or something like that, and I mix it up, it's hazardous waste, because it's still got gas in there, right? It's still catching on fire, okay? So, we accumulate our waste in one of two locations, okay? So at the end of your shift, it has to be accumulated in one of two locations. One is in, uh, uh, oops, how to accumulate throughout your shift. So you're accumulating waste throughout your shift. You can do that. You can either dump it in one of our locations where we have the drums and the funnels attached, or you can get a self-locking 55 gallon drum, accumulate your waste there, make sure it's closed, make sure it's uh, locked, ringed, grounded, and labeled, right? Just like a normal chemical. That's if you're accumulating it during your shift. At the end of your shift, we got to make sure we empty it in one of our two spots, either in the bunker room or along our paint line, which is one of our accumulation locations. That's where we dump our waste, no other places, okay? The labels that we have for our waste are one of these two, okay? And I can provide those to you and tell you what they are. Yeah. Fills can happen. The point, the thing I want you to remember is that it's dangerous. We want to clean them up right away. We don't want these things around. There's obviously other exposures, depending on the type of chemical. People can drink it, inject it, inhale it, absorb it through their skin. Uh, it's got some adverse effects. We want to take care of this right away. If it's if it's uh, if it's five gallons or less, it's your mess. If it's five gallons or more, go get some help. Okay. So if you got a spill going there, go ahead and take care of it. If it's a minor spill, if it's anything more than that, we want to we want to take a step back and we want to clean this the right way. Okay. Five gallons or less, it's your mess. I'm not saying don't get help. I'm just saying it's it, you, we can handle it with whatever group that we got going. Five gallons or more, let a supervisor know, okay? We have a spill response team, I'm on that. We manage those spills, okay? Uh, we wanna just take a step back beyond five gallons. We wanna make sure that we're not putting anybody at risk and then we're cleaning it up the right way. Dig? Okay, all right, cool. Five gallons or less, your mess. Managing a spill, just like when you're dealing with other chemicals, wear the right, right attire, okay? You need help, we'll give you the help that you need. Also, think about this. You have a spill. Is it a matter of closing a valve? <laughs> it's a leaking valve. Let's close it, right? Let's stop it. Shutting down a pump. Turn the power off, right? So if it's an active spill and it's spilling out, think about those things. Putting a bandage around, temporarily stopping the leak or slowing the leak, okay? Or positioning a leak container under to collect it. I just want you to think about these things. Build a barrier around the chemical. Stop the flow. Use absorbent materials. We have containers. What do we make here? Has, we make wood, right? Uh, cabinets. We have tons of, of dust, uh, sawdust in containers marked spill kit. Create a barrier around the chemical and sweep it away. Let's collect it, okay? The only thing I want you to remember is if it's a hazardous chemical you spilled, that's hazardous waste you collected. Give it to me, okay? I'm going to throw it away a different way. Can't go in the garbage, okay? If it's something water-based, clean it up. On. If it's a hazardous chemical, if it's acetone or something, one of our paints, 
it's still hazardous waste. Give it to me, I'll make sure it's disposed of the right way. Okay. So just an example of how to contain a spill. We also have little yellow kits. They look like suitcases, plastic suitcases. They say spill kit on them. They got a lot of these saturating materials and other things you can use as well. Okay. After the spill, remember that if it's hazardous, it has the same properties as if it was not waste. Okay, it's still hazardous. Decontaminate, clean up, let me know. What to do if an emergency happens? Okay, we don't, I asked the DNR this. I said, what, we don't have a thousand gallon containers sitting in here. We don't have five of them in the middle of the building. We have one 500 gallon tote of acetone. It's in a bunker room that's meant to contain a spill of that nature if we needed it. I asked the DNR, at what point would I evacuate the building if we had a problem here, right? They couldn't answer it. The only thing I'm gonna tell you is if we did have to evacuate the building, treat it like a fire. Okay. We would call it out the same way we would ask you to evacuate. I don't know what circumstance that would be. I mean, anything could happen, but any of the large chemicals that we have sitting out on the floor are all denatured. They're not hazardous. Okay, They're all water-based. Is there a blowout wall on that bunker? There is. Yeah. It's an explosion wall. Yeah, that's and the, it's the direct the blast the weakest. Correct. Part. So if there's a problem in that bunker, we're going to blow out away from the building. Right? Protected, yeah. Correct. And the same thing is if we had a major spill in there, oh. it's built it's built to handle, to contain that. We just tape the door up and call on a service to clean it. Right. You know, that's safe enough. We can continue to work yeah. is the point I'm trying to make. But if there yeah. was some reason that there was a chemical issue in this building and we needed to get out, treat it like a fire. Everybody out, right? Okay. All right. Lockout, tag out. Everybody know what that is? I know you do. Do you know what lockout, tag? Lock it, locking out a source of energy so that the maintenance member can perform their maintenance safely so they don't get electrocuted or shot up with air or whatever, whatever's going on in there, okay? Here's an example. This is not lockout, tag out. This is the defeating of a safety device that happened on this plant floor in November. Somebody threw a dime, and this is an e-stop. That's a light line. You pull the cord, e-stop, shuts the machine down, right? So there's a problem, you pull it, it shuts it down. Somebody threw a dime in there so that if I pulled that e-stop, it wouldn't shut down. There's not many things I would say this about that would get you locked off the property, okay? We don't defeat safety devices. If a breaker keeps tripping, he's not taping the breaker open, right? He's not taping it open. We're going to fix out why it's tripping, right? Same thing here. If something's not working right, we don't bypass it. We, we get it fixed. Not really like lockout, but it's a defeating of a safety device. It'd be like you trying to pull a lock off while he's trying to do his work, right, to turn the power on. We don't defeat that device, right? Okay. Um, so there's an example of uh, somebody in Wisconsin, a uh, maintenance worker, didn't lock out a piece of equipment, right? Somebody powered it up, and his hand got uh, ripped up, okay? Um, so it is... Trying to isolate the energy is either pneumatic, that's air, right? Hydraulic, that high pressure fluid. Electric, obvious, mechanical pr uh, power. Chemical or thermal, we have all those here. Okay, so they're gonna try to either determine what they need to lock out to do the work that they need to do. Um, it prevents that machine from being started up and it also notifies whoever's walking by, like you and me saying, oh, there's something going on there, I better not turn that on, right? Um, these are the types of devices you're going to see around here. I just want you to be familiar with them, right? Breaker lock, right? It goes over a breaker panel. That should be probably about the only time a breaker panel should be open. It's got a lock on it and a tag on it, okay? A single pole. So we have some of these by our machines. Some of the machines you work on, it's got a single pole, okay? So like a breaker except for the single pole, I can't power that on, right? That's easy. That's a plug with a cover over it. I can't plug it in, right? That's easy. Some of our air pressure, right? I can't active, actuate that nozzle to turn that on. We have a lot of these here too. 90 degree, I can't turn it on, right? These are hydraulics, okay? So they don't usually drain the hydraulic system unless the hydraulic line blows. So what they do is they extend everything up on the hydraulics. It takes a lot of the pressure off. They put a block in there, a bar or a lock. Then they can perform their, their work. I wouldn't want to be pulling that thing out, right, when he's working on it. Or on that, that's a press machine. Press machine's all the way extended. They chalk it in, right? So it doesn't, it can't come down. They can do their work. And I haven't seen one of these. If I do, I'm going to flip my top, okay? But that's a light switch type of 
source, you know, where they gets locked out. Okay, I haven't seen one of these. If they do, I want to know about it, but be familiar in case that, that happens. Okay. Where would you buy that? All right, I don't know. That would drive me absolutely bonkers. Wish that. <laughs> Okay, be familiar with the process here. Notify employees. Hey, Taylor, Tyler, Tyler, Tyler. I'm going to do work on your machine. Don't go on your machine, okay? Notifying you. Then he's going to shut down the equipment. He's going to isolate the energy, attach his device, release any stored energy he needs to release, verify it doesn't power on, right? Perform his work. Reverse order to turn it back up. Turn the power back on, de release, detach, de isolate. Turn the equipment back on, you're all set, you can go back on your equipment, thanks. Just be familiar with that, okay? Let these guys work, do their work safely. Let's not try to power something on when they're doing their work, okay? Near miss and injury reporting. The following things are mandatory to report here, okay? Injuries, injuries, okay? Anything more than a superficial cut on your finger, okay? Anything more than that, and here's why. I was a safety manager over at St. Norbert College, one of the theater directors. Those are the guys that do all the rigging and the lighting on the theater ops. He took a big broad cut along the back of his calf, not real deep, just a piece of metal that went, went down the back of his calf. Uh, didn't tell anybody and three weeks later it went septic and he had to go to the hospital. He was in the hospital for three days. I know it occurred at work, but I had a heck of a time proving that. You dig me? I had a heck of a time proving that. Don't put me in the position where I can't help you get every benefit you're entitled to if you get hurt, okay? So don't don't surprise me. If there's something going on, I got a first aid log. All I gotta do is write it down on my log. He's got a cut on his arm. If that heals, we're good, man, no problem. If it doesn't, boy, do I got a good story for the insurance company, don't I? He came in on April 2nd, told me he had a cut on his wrist. He came in on the 15th, I put a bandage on it because it was still oozing. By the 25th, it started to get infected. Insurance company try to deny that, right? Try. I want to see them try. They can't. Okay. I've had that happen here. We had a guy that has an uh, allergy to chemicals on the floor. Okay. And he got a rash. Okay. So now every time you get a rash, I'm not going to send you necessarily to a doctor, right? But try to handle it conservatively. Three or four weeks later, it wasn't getting any better. Go see a dermatologist. I had a real good storyline for that insurance company. Insurance companies don't make money by writing big checks. They get they try not to write benefits when they can, okay? So report these injuries, okay? Let me know about them, I wanna know about them. It's not to get you in a jam, it's to protect you and your interests, okay? So anything more than a superficial cut. So even like a, like a pinched finger or something, ends up being like fractured or broken or something like that? Yeah, report it, let me know. That could also lead to like helping figure out what's causing that. You could you prevent a future injury. You bet, like you bet it does. Someone else, like say you got cut, well, then someone else comes along and they do it more forcefully, and then they cut their finger off. Correct. <laughs> we don't need to wait for a board to come into your head to figure out that there's a problem with that cart you're pushing, right? No. Um, and we'll cover that. That's, there's near-miss reporting, too. So injuries is one, near-miss. You're pushing the cart of material, material comes by and strikes the front of your nose but doesn't hurt you. I don't need for it to wait to hit you in the head to figure out what's going on. Let me know about it. Give me the opportunity to fix it before you get, so you or somebody else gets seriously hurt, I don't want that, okay? Give me the opportunity, report that, let your boss know we have a process in place that we try to fix that and identify what the problem is, okay? Okay, so injury, near miss, and I'm gonna do one more, okay? Equipment or property damage, we're not 10 years old. I don't own this chair, just like you don't, okay? The company does. I'm not trying to get anybody in a jam, but if you break something, I don't mean a ra like a razor blade. I mean like a piece of equipment or a part of the building. Let's report it, okay? Supervisors get very excited like a loss prevention employee for Best Buy trying to pull video to figure out who broke something and didn't report it. You're on notice here now that you have to report a broken piece of equipment. It's also a safety concern for me. I don't want him coming in on the next shift where you broke something and didn't tell anybody, flips the machine on and sprays metal in his face, okay? Report these things. And maybe you just weren't trained right. I'm not going for your job. I'm not going to get you in trouble. I just want to figure out what's broken. Let's get it off the floor. Let's get it fixed, okay? So report broken equipment or damage to the, to the company property, okay? I'm not talking like a razor blade or a piece of wood or something like that, right? I'm talking about something bigger than that, right? Okay. Any questions on that? Injuries, property damage, 
near miss. Give me the opportunity to fix these near misses before somebody has to get hurt. We don't need that. So again, a near miss is just an unplanned act or event that did not result in an injury but had the propensity to do so. And seriously, maybe, right? Just uh, spell that out. Okay. You guys remember when you got your urinary tests here? You had the nurse come here? Okay, well the nurse comes every Wednesday. Okay, they come every Wednesday now. It's a benefit. I have a checklist outside of my office, sign up. If it's work related, just make sure I know. If it's personal, that's your business. It's the real deal, okay? They, uh, the doctor that manages this, he's the team doctor for the gamblers, the gamblers. He's like a 22 year ER doctor, he's fantastic. Gotta be honest with you, when I got hired, I didn't know what to think about that. This guy's the real deal. We had one of our maintenance workers that got, got a big broad cut on his hand, he needed five stitches on a Saturday. For the time it would take me to take him to the ER, and then you know how the ER works, right? Unless you're dying, you're gonna sit for three hours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he was doing stitches on my desk the right way, okay, in 15 minutes. So it's a good service, we use them on call. You can use them personally. We've had employees come here, report something minor, a uh, small infection, a cold that won't heal. They'll send a prescription right over to Walgreens, you pay six bucks for the medicine, you pay nothing. In fact, you get paid to see the nurse. So it's a real benefit, okay? Uh, and I'm telling you, they're the real deal. I'm not trying to sell you a Cadillac. They're very good, okay? They come every week. There's a checklist outside of my office. Put your name down. If it's work, the only thing I ask is if it's work related, make sure I know about it. It's so like, again, like I was saying, we gotta, we gotta communicate. That's it. Don't bring your family, don't bring your girlfriend, don't, don't bring your pets, <laughs> nothing like that. It's just for us, but it's a benefit. It's a heck of a benefit. <laughs> and then they're on call, so we page them when we need them too, okay? Any questions on that? Excellent benefit. When in doubt, I, I wouldn't hesitate. My wife's a doctor, and I would, I would want to see my wife. I'd, I'd rather see this guy, so sign up, okay? It's, they're really that good. Combustible dust, okay? No kidding. Sawdust is combustible, right? It's going to fall in the top categories of all events that cause fires um, across the United States for OSHA. Okay, sawdust is dangerous. And because it's a suspended, it's a, a particulate matter suspended in the air that can cause mass oxidation quickly. Okay, I mean, we're going to be at the top of all these categories. Wood <coughs> dust, right? There we are. One third of all explosions, wood, right? Why? Can't about furniture, cabinet making, wood dust. We're right there. It's because we cut work, turn, finish, drill, machine, plane, round. We cut, we work with wood, okay? But we do a lot right, okay? We, uh, we test our air every 12 months, okay? So here's the limits that OSHA says you can have sawdust in your facility. We're hardly even recordable. We're less than 20% of that level, okay? We test it every year. We have a lot of our machines that have vacuum systems on it. So a lot of our sanding equipment, that entire booth is under pressure. The whole building's under negative pressure. Pushes all the air outside, all the dust goes out. We have daily cleanup. We have weekly cleanup checklists. We have an annual blowdown that we do. I'm trying to put you at ease. We do, we do a very good job, okay? In fact, I would, I would challenge somebody to go to any small woodworking shop, see how they look versus how we look. Oh, we keep a very clean place, yeah. However, it's still very dangerous. If fires were to happen here, they're gonna happen very quickly. Out of the building, make notification, right? You're not fooling around. Keep all your fire creating devices off my plant floor, okay? You got a lighter, you're a smoker, it's fine. Keep it in your car or in your locker. I do not want anything out there, okay? All right. And then one other thing I was going to say, I already said this. If you find that you're reacting negatively to the respiration of that dust, let me know. I'll get you something to protect yourself or help ease that, that issue, okay? Compressed air. Um, we operate these air guns like this under 30 PSI or more. In no way, shape, or form does it say anywhere in the law that I can take this air gun and blow it on myself to blow my clothes off or to fool around and blow it in your face. In fact, it's dangerous if you do, okay? So don't let me see you do it. We have a blowdown station in the hallway right outside by the time clocks. Where it's on vacuum, it's safe, you can flip it on. I get it, you don't wanna put the dust in your car or bring it home, pull it down, okay? 
but the air guns that we have out there, they're meant for cleaning machinery or floors or wood. They're not built for this. This is get you in trouble, okay? In fact, there's medical problems associated with that. Just like when you go get a shot, you put a needle up in the air, they're, it's not because they're trying to look cool, they're trying to jet out the air, right, in the, in the syringe. Your blood, your circulatory system is a closed system. You would invent or introduce an air bubble to that, it causes what they call an aerial embolism, okay? It puts air into your closed circulatory system. That hits your brain, it causes a stroke. That hits your heart, it causes a heart attack. Worst wise, it's going to, at least wise, it's going to cause catastrophic damage in a vein or an artery and a clot, okay? Don't do it. Don't blow that air on yourself. Another issue associated with it is hearing loss or hemorrhaging of the brain. Take 30 PSI, run it across your ear canal, your inner ear or your middle ear are going to become permanently damaged. If it hits the right way, it'll hemorrhage into your brain, kill you, okay? And then the, just injuries. It's, you're blowing dust at a high rate of speed that's not protected, and we were we got dust everywhere out there, so then you're injecting it into your eye or into an open part of your body. Not a good idea. Please don't do it, okay? That's my last slide. I know I've been going for a while. See something, say something, let me know. Let me know how I can help you. I expect you to say hi to me out on the floor when you see me walking around out there, and, and, and come talk to me, engage me in a conversation, okay? if you need to, if there's something going on.